of the Federal Society is a nonpartisan, conservative, and libertarian organization dedicated to freedom, federalism, and judicial restraint. The Federal Society seeks to educate the legal community through its programs and publications about how limited constitutional government based on the rule of law can have a positive effect in law and public policy. Our student app chapter aims to host one event per month to spark discussion and create dialogue on a hot button legal issue. As a reminder, we do have two more events coming up this semester. On Wednesday, March 21st, we have an event on union dues in the Janus case. And on Wednesday, April 4th, we are having a Supreme Court roundup. Be sure to check our uh, email list and our Facebook page for more information on those events. But we are very excited about our event today, featuring our speaker, Professor, Professor Josh Blackman. He is an associate professor at the South Texas College of Law in Houston, who specializes in constitutional law, the United States Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. He's the author of the critically acclaimed, unprecedented, the constitutional challenge to Obamacare. He's also the founder and president of the Harlan Institute, the founder of the Fantasy SCOTUS, the internet's premier Supreme Court fantasy league. If you're bored, you know, there's no more football. You, you should all play. This, so. um, and blogs at joshblackman.com. Professor Blackman clerked for Honorable Danny J. Boggs on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and the Honorable Kim R. Gibson at the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Pennsylvania. And he's a graduate of George Mason University School of Law. We will then hear commentary and rebuttal from DePaul's very own Professor Anna Santos Rutschman. Professor Rutschman is the 2016 through 18 Jaharis Faculty Fellow in Health Law and Intellectual Property. Her primary research and teaching interests include intellectual property, health law, innovation policy, and regulation in the life sciences. Professor Rutschman received her SJD and LLM from Duke Law School, as well as an LLM and law degree from UCP Law School in Portugal. We'll be sure to save time at the end for a Q&A portion, so feel free to write down questions as we go along. And without further ado, please welcome Professor Josh Rutschman. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I don't think as we rebuttal, it'll be more like a question and answer, but uh, we have plenty of time for discussion. Thank you all so much. My first time at DePaul, I was at the other law school across the street. I've never been here, so it's a pleasure. Uh, my goal for today, if I can do it, is to squeeze in the 30 minutes the entire history of healthcare reform in the United States. I think I can do it, but it'll be moving pretty quick. So our story doesn't actually start in 2009 with President Obama's inauguration. It actually starts much earlier when many of you weren't even alive yet. Now, does anyone know what this picture represents? Oh, come on, someone. What's going on here? Yeah, yeah. Hillary Care, thank you very much. After President Clinton's election in 1992, he appointed his wife, First Lady Hillary Clinton, to chair a task force to reform health insurance. And her proposal, known as the Health Security Act, would have basically given every American access to health insurance. Did this make it into law? No, it did not. In large part because of a series of commercials known as the Harry and Louise ads. What were these commercials? You had a husband and wife sitting around a table and trying to read this big, you know, this big complicated. Okay, so everyone please take your burrito out of the wrapper. Because it's really distracting. Just take your burrito out of the wrapper. Unwrap it, go ahead, take 30 seconds to do it. <laughs> I've done this before, trust me. Anything in wrapped is the worst thing to have when you're speaking. Oh, oh I hear the silence, it's perfect. Thank you so much. So the Harry and Louise ads were a series of commercials that aired in the 1990s. And you had a husband and wife sitting around a table thinking, do I want this Hillary care? Do I want this health care reform? And the crux of the commercial is this. I don't want the government getting between me and my doctor. I like my insurance. I want to keep my insurance. These commercials were so effective that within the span of about a year, they plummeted. They dropped down the popularity of Hillary Care. As a result, it didn't go anywhere. These commercials illustrated a fairly basic aspect of healthcare law, right? When you're talking about insurance, there are three big categories to think about. Is it affordable? That is it cheap, right? Is it comprehensive? How much stuff does it cover? And is it accessible, right? Does everyone have access to it? As a general matter, I'll give you two of those. You can't get you all three, right? If you want it to be cheap, it's probably not going to be very good, or it might not cover lots of people. If you want it to be comprehensive, cover lots of things, it's going to be expensive. 
And if you want to give it to everyone, that is, everyone has access to insurance regardless of their health, it's probably not going to be cheap, right? This is a fairly basic aspect of healthcare economics, you know, simplifying a bit. But it teaches a lesson about health insurance. If people want to keep the plans they have, which are often very cheap and not very comprehensive, it makes it that they won't be accessible to everyone. And this is the basis for one of the major promises in which the ACA was sold. Right, that if you like your plan, you keep your plan. Why was this promise so important? To avoid the errors of Hillary Care in the 90s. If people believed that they would lose the health insurance they had, they wouldn't support this new thing. So the promise was you can keep what you have. Now we know in hindsight, it didn't quite work out that way. Right? So moving forward to 2009, after President Obama came to office, he made his significant legislative priority health care reform, right? And it became known as the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. This was a 3,000 page bill. It was very long. Uh, I haven't read it, maybe my friend has, but few people have read it in their entirety. In fact, members of Congress who vote on it didn't actually read the entire bill. Senator Max Baucus, the chair of the Finance Committee said, I pay people to read bills for me. So maybe one day when you all work in government, you can read bills to people you work for. But members hadn't actually read the bill. On December 24, 2009, the Senate voted on the Affordable Care Act. They voted on an early draft of it. This was never meant to be the final version of the bill, but they wanted to vote on December 24th. What happened next is actually stunning. In 2010, January, a Republican from Massachusetts won a special election in the Senate, Scott Brown. Because of Scott Brown's victory, the Democrats lost their 60-vote filibuster-proof majority. They lost that block. As a consequence, right, the Democrats no longer had a way to easily pass the bill. So you had a vote in the Senate on this draft version of the bill. What you could have done is have the House vote on the same version. But the problem was this. The House didn't like the Senate version of the bill. So Speaker Pelosi and Representative Boehner had to go back and forth but there was no compromise to be had. Eventually, on March 23rd of 2010, the ACA passed the House by a vote of 219 to 210. I hope you can see that, 219 to 210. The significant number right here, if I move it quickly enough, makes a zero, is the fact that not a single Republican voted for the health care reform. A lot of the problems in health care reform today, I think, stems from this vote. The fact that half the country opposed it even though in large measure it was a Republican idea with a mandate that was a conservative proposal. But they opposed it. And to this day, they still want nothing to do with this. We still have these repeal votes that happen over and over again. No matter. The, the law goes to the president. He signs it into law. Okay? Usually when the president signs a bill into law, that's the end of the story, right? You lost a political battle, but the constitutional battle would come next. That is. Was the ACA lawful? What is it? Was it constitutional? And the question was, for those of you who have taken con law, could Congress compel people to buy insurance under the individual mandate? That is, could Congress require you to buy a commercial product? This was a subject of my first book, Unprecedented. Uh, uh, and the case was iconicized, if I can make up a word, with a piece of broccoli. That is, can Congress make you buy broccoli? If everyone buys broccoli, they might eat it, we'll be healthier, right? By the same extension, can they make you buy health insurance? Now, the Supreme Court, in the decision of NFIB versus Sebelius, said that no, you cannot make people buy health insurance, but you can tax people for going uninsured. This was Chief Justice's saving construction, which makes me sad every time I teach it. But the court upheld the ACA mandate under the saving construction as a tax. But this was only the beginning of the lawfare against the ACA. Shortly after the NFB decision, Mitt Romney was running for president. We don't remember this anywhere, but he was, right? And he ran the platform repealing and replacing Obamacare. How did that go? Not very well. <laughs> In the election of 2012, President Obama won handedly. Here is Chief Justice Roberts giving the oath. I'm sure he was saying, thanks, buddy, right? But the Chief Justice saved the law and then swore in the next president. But this did not end the battle over Obamacare. It's only the first phase. The next phase concerns religious liberty and rights of conscience. 
Okay? So during the debate over the ACA, most people are focused on a question that's very controversial. Does it fund abortions, right? This was the big question. Does Obamacare fund abortions? Um, it didn't, right? There wasn't any new funding for abortions. But there was a secondary issue that was a lot more important, right? Beyond funding for abortions, Congress created what became a new mandate, what became known as the contraception mandate. Now, there was nothing in the law itself that required employers to provide contraceptive care for their female employees. What the law says is employers must provide preventive care for women. What's preventive care for women? As we know, Congress delegated that job to the government, the executive branch. And through several different agencies, HHS, HRSA, Institute of Medicine, the executive branch ultimately said that employers must cover all FDA-approved forms of contraception. Everything from the condom to the birth control pill to the morning after pill and these various other, uh, 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 various other devices. Okay? Again, the actual law Congress passed didn't have the definition of preventive care in the statute. This was done by an agency. So the consequence, now as a matter of law, you actually have the government requiring employers to give women access to birth control. This is one of my, this is actually a real ad, by the way. I swear this is real. It says, let's get physical. OMG, he's hot. Let's hope he's as easy to get as his birth control. <laughs> my health insurance covers a pill, which means all I have to worry about is getting him between the covers. I got insurance. I swear this is a real government ad. And see, she's giving thumbs up holding a pack of pills. His hands are in his pocket. He's smiling. Sounds great, right? Except who is paying for these pills? Nuns. You see, under the original version of the contraceptive mandate, churches and houses of worship were exempt. But religious organizations, nonprofits such as the Little Sisters of the Poor, were not exempt. That is, the first go-round, they were required to pay for birth control. Now, this became very unpopular. And even progressives said, whoa, 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 this is going too far. You can't make the nuns pay for birth control. So they crafted what became known as an accommodation, right? Either the government or the health insurance company would pay for the contraceptives, but the nuns still had to offer it on their plan, right? They had to offer it on their plans. Okay. That was for religious nonprofits. But what about religious for profits, such as Hobby Lobby? We'll get back there later. But the ACA was as much about law as it was about politics. I had largely assumed that after President Obama won re election, the battle to you know, repeal Obamacare would finish, right? Did it? Did people stop trying to repeal Obamacare in 2013? No. So Senator Ted Cruz in 2013 had his entire movement to defund Obamacare, right? He traveled across the country with Mike Lee saying, we need to stop Obamacare. He even mounted a 25-hour, wasn't a filibuster, but a 25-hour speech in the Senate saying, we need to stop Obamacare. What was the effect of the speech? Um, Obamacare remained funded, but eventually the Republicans voted to deny President Obama a budget, and the government shut down. Now again, Ted Cruz did not filibuster and shut down the government. There was about a week between his speech and the shutdown. But his speech galvanized Republicans that we're not going to fund the government unless Obamacare is defunded. Okay. That's not how it worked. The Affordable Care Act, the subject, was called a permanent appropriation. Even if the government shuts down, Obamacare continues, like the mail and Social Security, right? It was still funded. So this entire charade had no purpose whatsoever. It didn't result in anything positive other than maybe kickstarting Ted's uh, presidential campaign, which I definitely supported. But the, uh, <laughs> this gambit of shutting down the government didn't do anything. In fact, we saw a couple weeks ago, the shutdown lasts, what, three days, two days? Not very long. This is not a good strategy to do anything. Nonetheless, the federal parks shut down, including the World War II Memorial. Uh, uh, these, these, the veterans who came to see the memorial, their honor, could not enter. What happened? These vets. They weren't stopped at the beaches of Normandy, so these little stupid barricades were not stopped them either. They went to the memorial, they lifted up the barricades, they dropped them off, and they did their thing. But eventually, all good things must come to an end. The shutdown finished, the debt ceiling was raised, and Obamacare continues. This entire thing to shut down Obamacare didn't accomplish anything. But this was just the first salvo of what would happen next. 
Shortly after the shutdown finished, the website launched healthcare.gov, which was designed to be a platform where people could purchase health insurance on the federal exchange. Unfortunately, it didn't work. It was a really, really expensive website, spent a lot of money developing it, and people were not able to sign up. It became an absolute nightmare. And for nearly a month, people were unable to register for health insurance. People said they're waiting and waiting and waiting, right? For a brief period, President Obama considered pulling the plug, a poor choice of word health law, but considered pulling the plug on the website, saying we just can't do it. But call on the nerds, right? The so-called tech surge was used to bring in these Silicon Valley whisk kits to build a website the government could not now. We think of the tech search, you think of like hundreds of nerds coming in, they like five guys from Facebook and Google, right? We built the entire website in about a month. We did everything it had to do. And as Obama fingers crossed, it worked. And by the time early 2014 rolled around, people were able to sign up for health insurance and get this new coverage. But then the very next scandal started blowing up, which was cancellations. Contrary to the president's promise that you can keep the health care you like, People start getting these letters in the mail. If anyone got one, you know what these look like, right? Your policy is being canceled because of the health care law. Now, notwithstanding this promise, you can keep your plan. That was never meant to be. If your plan didn't comply with these new stringent requirements and you weren't grandfathered in, you would lose your health insurance. And millions of people have lost their care this way. In fact, PolitiFact said this was a lie of the year. I don't know politicians had a lie of the year. I'm sure Donald Trump is now breaking that record on a daily basis with each subsequent tweet. But at the time, this was a big deal, just a flat out lie. Yet, despite these uh, cancellations, people enrolled, enrolled, enrolled. They went down to the local Obamacare store. I don't know where this Obamacare store is. I'm sure it exists somewhere. But you go to your local Obamacare store, and you get health insurance. Ultimately, by the end of the enrollment period, nearly 8 million people had signed up. And this was a significant victory for a website that started off on a very shaky footing. We go back to religious liberty. And I need to give you a little bit of common law background. There's a case in the early 1990s involving a Native American, a guy named Al Smith. And as part of his religion, he used peyote. This is a hallucinogenic cactus. Okay? He was fired from his job because of use of this cactus, but he was a drug counselor. But he was fired from his job as a drug counselor because of his use of drugs. He applied for unemployment benefits. He was denied because the state said, you were fired for breaking the law. He said, no, no, no. This is my religion, right? My religion protects my right to access this peyote. The Supreme Court ruled against him in a very controversial 5-4 decision, Employment Division versus Smith. A very controversial decision. Congress tried to reverse Smith. They tried to say the federal government will give additional protections to religious exercise in a bill known as the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA. And this law said that if the government puts a substantial burden on your religion, they need a really good reason to do it. A really good reason to do it. Okay? It was on this basis that the Hobby Lobby Corporation challenged the individual mandate. They argued that by requiring them to pay for birth control, to pay for health insurance, they were imposing a substantial burden on religious exercise. Now, wait a minute. Can a corporation have religious exercise? Can a corporation with stores across the country even have these rights? There's no doubt that David and Barbara Green who founded the company, right? They have religious beliefs. But does a mandate operate on the Greens? By the way, this is their family. It looks like a Christmas card, right? Does, does the mandate operate on the Green family? Or does it operate on the corporation? Now, the Greens didn't object to all forms of birth control, only four specific things, uh, which they deemed abortifacients, which include, include IUDs uh, and certain emergency contraceptives. Okay? But they, they had no problem with the pill. So this case went to the Supreme Court. right? And one of my ways of teaching SCOTUS cases was signs. I love the signs outside the court. This is one of my favorites. It says, if men could get pregnant, <coughs> birth control would be from gumball machines and be bacon flavored. This one the back is good. My mom is not raised to be a grandma. Okay, maybe. This is not a church, it's a craft store. This is not a healthcare plan, it's a Bible. Uh, and this girl, if you can't tell, is dressed as a pack of birth control pills. Okay? These ones, no bosses in my bedroom. Hey, Supreme Court. This little guy in a suit in the, in, in the bedroom, right? Uh, contraception is business. 
I'm sorry, is my business. You can't quite see the my <clears throat> on this on, the, on this projection. Okay. Corporations are not people, my friend. Ah, she's my favorite. Does anyone know what she's holding? <laughs> Say it loud. Yeah, it's a crocheted uterus. I'm fairly positive that she's not by the, uh, the the yarn at Hobby Lobby. But it says, Hobby Lobby, this uterus is for you. And in fact, there's an entire group of women who mailed crocheted, ut uteri, crocheted uteri to the Hobby Lobby headquarters in Kansas City as a, as a token of, of, of uh, friendly, friendship, I suppose. Right? This one, keep your hobbies off my ovaries. Now, the pro-life signs just aren't as good. I am pro-life, pro-life generation, team life, OK? And then you have these guys. Um, I don't know what they were doing, but <laughs> God's laws comes first. Repeal the socialist Obamacare. OK. Fortunately, the Supreme Court does not decide cases based on signs, in which cases would have gone the other way. Uh, but the key issue in this case was, could a, or could a corporation exercise religion? And you probably know there was a case called Citizens United some years earlier, where religious, I'm sorry, corporations had free speech rights. What about free exercise rights? This question actually wasn't that hard. The courts put seven to two on this question, not five to four. Why? The statute that created RIFRA has something called the Dictionary Act. And it defines the word person to include a corporation. Um, and there are actually a lot of cases in American law where corporations have had rights. Imagine if a kosher butcher, right? Kosher butcher shop. And they incorporate. Does the mere <clears throat> fact they incorporated mean they no longer have any rights? Could the government say to this kosher, uh, kosher butcher, you have to use a stun gun when you slaughter animals, which makes animals not kosher? Okay. The harder question was, did this law, which made them buy birth control, impose a substantial burden? Now, no one was making the Green family take the contraception. Like, no one made them pop the birth control pill. The question is, does paying for someone else to use this burden your religion? On this question, the court split five to four, and the answer was yes. That imposes a substantial burden on religion. Now, the dissent, the prominent dissent, was from Justice Ginsburg, often known as the notorious RBG, right? Um, this was actually the case where I think she lost it. This, this is where I think it went to her head, because she was had with Katie Couric. She had this you know, T-shirt. Um, by the way, Justice Ginsburg wears his collars around an ethical called jabots. This is her dissenting jabot. So if you see her wearing this one, she's about to dissent. In fact, <laughs> I've been at the court, and they don't tell you in advance. What's going on. I'm like, ah, oh, she's got the dissent jabot coming out, so you can tell in advance. <laughs> But she and Justice Scalia were very good friends, had a very sharp disagreement in this case. So here, the pro-life crowd won. Uh, 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 you know, this, this girl's blowing kisses. I don't know what she's doing there. Uh, but this was the first victory after MFIB against the ACA. The next case is a lot more boring. It involves subsidies, which no one cares about. But the Affordable Care Act has a statute that says uh, certain subsidies are available for plans purchased on a state exchange, right? If, a, 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 if an exchange is established by the state, you get these subsidies. Now, what does established by the state mean? One would think it means established by the state. But in another decision called King v. Burwell, the Supreme Court said, no, no, no. Established by the state is best understood to mean a federal or state exchange. I am not going to bore you with the uh, details of that opinion because it drives me crazy every time. What I will tell you is this decision kept the ACA stable, at least for a little bit. Had those subsidies been cut, right? Had those subsidies been cut, the funding for the law would have plummeted and been very difficult to maintain. Now, in hindsight, President Trump stopped those subsidies about a year ago. He stopped them. And actually, the sky hasn't stopped falling. So one of the things about healthcare law, which I don't pretend to be an expert on, um, a lot of the, the sky's falling predictions just don't come true. They said, if these subsidies stop, everything will go to hell. Hasn't happened. If the mandate's repealed, everything will go to hell. Well, the mandate was repealed, and people aren't that worried about it. So there's a resilience here that, that perhaps is uh, 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 underappreciated. Okay? But I want to talk now about the nuns. I mentioned them earlier. Uh, these are the Little Sisters of the Poor, um, a group of nuns. And their job is to tend to the elderly and to the sick and people who don't have a lot of money. Um, their mission is serving the poor, as their name suggests. It's not about providing a comprehensive health care package for their employees. Now, under the original Obamacare regulations, they were required to pay for the birth control of their employees. Right? That was the original iteration of the plan. That one went out the window. 
The next iteration was what's called the accommodation, in which they were not required to pay for it, but they had to sign a document saying that we authorize our insurance company to provide it. If they didn't sign that paper, the insurance company would lack the legal authority to provide this insurance. Again, the nuns didn't have to pay for it. All they do is sign this document authorizing provision of health care. The nuns refused to sign it, saying that by us signing it, we become complicit in sin, right? That we're part of this sinful arrangement and we don't want anything to do with this. Okay? This case went to the Supreme Court. I was actually there for oral arguments. But the reason why this case was a little bit special is that there were only eight justices on the bench. This case was argued during the period in which Justice Scalia had passed away. And I was sitting there, I was sitting maybe a foot behind the Solicitor General. And from my vantage point, the court looked pretty divided, right? It looked pretty divided. And here was the issue. Could the government find another way of ensuring that employees of the Little Sisters got access to birth control? Sure they could have. But would that additional route have created burdens for women? Was it seamless, right? Sure, these female employees could have signed up on some other website, gotten government funding, et cetera. But was this the most narrowly tailored way, the, most, the least restrictive way of giving these women birth control without burdening religion? Okay? After the case was argued, right, after the case was argued, the nuns came down the steps. It was an amazing sight. It was actually pretty astounding to see. You had all the local Catholic schools in the area had basically dismissed their students early. Right, so you had basically hundreds of Catholic school kids in uniform standing in the Supreme Court Plaza cheering. And they were singing like the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem. They were singing all these songs. It was, it was pretty cute. Um, but they came out there and they gave this really passionate speech to Mother Lorraine, saying that, you know, we are, um, you know, we're nuns. We're here to serve the poor. Um, it's not our job to do this. If the government wants to give these women health insurance, they can do it by their means. The case, though, would never actually resolve we would never get a decision on the merits. Instead, the Supreme Court issued this strange order which made no one happy. And it basically said, we're going to send this case back down for you guys to think about it some more. Think about it some more. Now, we all knew what was going on there, right? There were only eight justices on the court at that time, only eight they couldn't cobble together a five-member majority. And they were hoping, perhaps, that when the case came back up, there would be a ninth justice who could help break the divide. What they did anticipate, though, <laughs> was Donald Trump, right? They all expected that Hillary Clinton would win, they would appoint Merrick Garland or someone similar to the Supreme Court, and the case would come back up, and they would rule in favor of the government against the Little Sisters. That was probably the game plan. Um, that didn't happen. As it turns out, they sent it back out to the lower courts where it would stay until after the election. And indeed, President Trump was elected. Now, I want to focus the last few minutes of my talk on how the Trump administration has handled Obamacare. Now, the book, uh, which was just sitting over there on the table, uh, uh, wraps up in the fall of 2016. I don't talk about the election. I just, I didn't get there. I, I, the book finished, and I was like, I'm not talking about the election. Um, this is not what I expected to happen, but it happened. So first off, what about the Little Sisters and Hobby Lobby? The Trump administration basically said, we are going to rescind the health care mandate for contraception. We're going to rescind it. This is currently being litigated. And a number of states have argued that the uh, president lacks the authority to rescind this. It violates the uh, Administrative Procedure Act, and indeed, it represents an animus towards women. But as it stands now, the nuns are not under a mandate. They've been uh, forgiven, and they've been allowed to not have this coverage. Can I mention this? What about the, the, the health care subsidies, right, at King v. Burwell? Trump said, we're going to stop paying these, right? They're not authorized by law. We're going to stop them. And the, the sky hasn't quite fallen yet although there's litigation over those subsidies as well. The big biggie is repealing Obamacare, right? Now, President Trump said over and over again, we're going to repeal Obamacare and replace it with something terrific, right? Replace it with something great. That was, the, that was the slogan. 
Didn't happen. <laughs> so there were several efforts in the early months of the Trump administration to repeal Obamacare. Um, none of them were able to get past the 50 vote block in the Senate. Let me explain this. Um, as you know, to pass a bill, school as rocks, you have a bill in the House, you have a bill in the Senate. Um, usually in the Senate, to do anything of substance, you need 60 votes, what's called a filibuster proof majority. But there's an exception, what's called budget reconciliation, which means for certain budgetary matters, you can actually um, uh, uh, pass laws without a filibuster. So the Democrats really couldn't stop it. But you needed 50 votes in the Senate plus the vice president's vote. So there were several proposals to repeal Obamacare. They all failed. Because in each case, several Republican senators broke rank and voted against the law. And one of the reasons why they voted against it were the headlines you saw. If Obamacare is repealed, 20 million people lose insurance, 10 million people lose insurance, whatever the number is, like these, these, these huge numbers. Oh my God, people will stop buying insurance. It's going to be the end of the world. These projections by the Congressional Budget Office were premised on the fact that the mandate was making people buy insurance. And if you lost the mandate, people would stop buying insurance. This was never the case. The mandate penalty was so low that most people didn't actually find it as an incentive. In fact, a lot of these people got exemptions. The government just gave out exemptions. If you had your power shut off, you were exempted from the mandate. If you changed your job, you were exempted. Right? So all these, all these exemptions. So it turns out that people weren't really being motivated by the mandate. But then, about a month ago, I guess two months ago now, in December of 2017, the House passed tax reform, right? The big tax bill. <clears throat> now, perhaps one of the most significant aspects of this bill that no one noticed is that it repealed the individual mandate. Now, it passed on basically a straight party line vote. Remember the ACA passed with no Republican votes? <clears throat> this passed with zero Democrat votes. And there was one provision, which again, virtually no one paid attention to. But the Republicans managed to repeal the individual mandate. They repealed it. Now, they didn't actually repeal it. What they did was they said to zero, right? That the penalty for not having insurance is now zero dollars and zero percent. So if going forward in 2018, if you're not insured, you will not face a penalty, right? The core of Obamacare has now been repealed. The Supreme Court said Obamacare cannot exist without the mandate. Well, now it will. And much to my surprise, people aren't that worried about it, right? The sky is not falling, as often I was told it would. Um, the reason why this change is significant is this will affect the Congressional Budget Office's calculations, right? Any future efforts to repeal Obamacare will not have to deal with 20 million people will lose insurance because these numbers will no longer be hinging on the mandate. Now, I don't think the Republicans have the vote to do anything or the stomach to do anything, so it's a moot point, but this was a big change. Uh, here is President Trump when he signed the bill. He stressed that even though the Supreme Court didn't nullify it, he would. Let me read you what Trump said. He said, quote, Many people thought it's been overturned in the Supreme Court, that is Obamacare. It didn't quite make it. Almost, but didn't quite make it. But now we're overturning the individual mandate, the most unpopular thing in Obamacare. Now, the remainder of the ACA stays. The Medicaid expansion, I didn't talk about that much, that's still in law, right? All the regulations on how government must, um, how insurance must guarantee issue to people based on their, uh, uh, where they live, not based on their health, that's still in the law. So, Almost all aspects of Obamacare remain, except for the core, the mandate, which no longer will exist starting in 2018, and I don't see it coming back at any point. I will stop here, and I welcome questions from everyone in the room, but I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Whatever you're comfortable with. Thank you. Uh, Professor Blackman for coming to talk to us um, today. And there are two things you don't know about. Um, 
permanent building production. The first one is that you did consult informally for um, Senator Cruz, is that? Oh, I did, yeah. Uh, of course, so in addition to going to the Supreme Court and, you know, tracking literally everything in real time that was happening, you know, um, during all this uh, period, you had, you know, very specific insights into uh, all um, this process. And I really want to recommend um, this book. I had the chance of reading it. Um, last week, the second thing you don't know about Professor Blackman is that he's the future screenplay um, writer for the ACA um, <laughs> movie. Uh, Meryl Streep to play you know, Nancy Pelosi or Believe something her. like that. Um, some of the titles of the sections were up there, but let me just guide you through this. The first one is called The Promise of Obamacare. The second one, Conscious and con Contraception. The third one, Shutdown. Number four, Obamacare unravels. Number five, religious liberty. Number six, nuclear fallout. Number seven, subsidizing Obama Obamacare. And number eight, the nuns, uh, which sort of traces your uh, presentation. But really, it's a fascinating story. Um, it's a particular point of view that Professor Blackman uh, brings to the table. And I really, really encourage you um, to read the book, which is available from our uh, I think it's in our bookstore. I rushed it from Amazon. Whoa, yeah. these guys have their act together. Yeah, and the library uh, yeah. has a copy, mm -hmm. as uh, I understand. Um, in addition to reading the book, um, I see some familiar faces who are about to graduate. I see some younger faces who are now beginning law school. And one of the interesting things about the topic for today, um, and particularly your approach um, to this, um, is that it touches upon so many different things that you've been thinking quite deeply over either the past two and a half years or you're about to launch. Um, and not just from a healthcare perspective. I mean, as you mentioned, this has to do with healthcare, but a lot more um, than healthcare um, per se. So let me highlight um, just a couple of um, things for you. One has specifically to do with um, healthcare. The other one is broader, more in, along the lines of, you know, what's the relationship between you know, federal power and state power, how do these things um, go together? What does our political process look like as we make decisions, as like many, many decisions uh, that impact the lives of millions and millions of Americans? So um, the first thing that um, I would like to highlight, and Professor Blackman mentioned this, um, is a trilemma. Uh, when we talk about healthcare, there are three things that um, you do discuss extensively in the book that we're looking for three but they're not compatible. Um, from an economic point of view, we cannot have our you know, dream checklist for healthcare, which is we want it to be accessible to everybody. We want it to be comprehensive. We don't want to be in you know, conditions excluded. There we go. Um, and we want it to be affordable. And um, you alluded to this um, at the beginning. The idea before Obamacare, before the ACA, is that we could have um, affordable health care, it was just not um, comprehensive, or some people could not get into it, uh, they could not uh, get um, the health care package they wanted it, unless they were willing to spend a whole lot of money. The moment you decide something has to be affordable, you kind of shift uh, all this equilibrium. So really, I mean, this is um, something that I think parties along, you know, the divide that there seems to be when we discuss healthcare um, questions. People agree that it's very, very difficult to bring all these things together. So part of what we're all trying to do, no matter how we do it and the approach we take to healthcare reform, is, you know, ultimately unattainable. So we need to make some compromises. How we go about it is what's vastly different. You know, the way Hillary Care worked was vastly different from what Obamacare initially looked like, and Obamacare itself today is very different from what it was a few months ago or um, <laughs> five months ago. So be aware that we're all fighting, you know, conceptually, even privately, I assume, over these things. It's just keep in mind we're trying to attain something that economically is unfeasible. So we're looking for a second best regime. That second best is defined very differently depending on the approach we take. So that's uh, my first um, point, which I think you do make uh, in your book. I think it's fair um, to say that. The second one is because there is no easy solution from an economic um, point of view, 
politically and socially, the way we try to reform healthcare presents very interesting questions. And one thing I want to highlight today is how all this has turned into a variation on, on our social contract. So the idea is, I'm getting some things from society from this state, and I'm giving some things in return. It's a very blunt formulation of what the social contract looks like. Turns out that, and Professor Blackman chronicles this in the book, turns out that pre-Obamacare, people were pretty happy with their health care. A large majority of people in the US said, I'm very happy with my health care. At the same time, they acknowledge that not everybody is as well off as I am. So I would like for other people to be better off, but I'm happy. The problem is, when you ask the same group of people, OK, for you to be well off and other people to be well off as well, you have to pay more. Are you happy with that? And people didn't want the choice, right? So what Obamacare eventually did was to say to these people who were happy but acknowledge that systemically you know, we had some trouble uh, and not everybody was as well off. What Obamacare did initially was to say, fine, but you healthy people, you people who don't need to pay you know, as much, you'll now subsidize sicker people and the system that <laughs> will be fairer. And a lot of people did not agree with this. But notice how the social contract is shifting and has shifted recently. And now with um, the Trump administration, it has shifted again because we've said no penalty, right? So um, also an evolution on this side of the piece. Third, um, and very quickly, there's a story that you tell um, in the book um, that you did not have the time to cover here. When we negotiate how to implement um, things like Obamacare, there's always a very intense um, fight um, between states and the federal government. But even amongst states, everybody, every representative wants the best possible deal uh, for its own state. So um, Van Nelson yes. um, managed to get something called the Corn Husker um, Kickback. kickback. Um, and under this deal, Nebraska, and only Nebraska, yeah. as you mentioned in the book, was uh, getting a permanent um, subsidy from the federal government for Medicaid. So it was the only state in the union getting this beneficial treatment. And I really encourage you to either read um, the book on this part or Google this. So we're talking about a political process with many, many ramifications. But keep in mind that states are fighting in ways that sometimes we might disagree from. Right? So there was a deal on the table that was accepted that allowed a single state in the union to get subsidized permanently for Medicaid implementation in exchange for Ben Nelson's vote. Right? Um, he claims he, there was not a quid pro quo, but that's, that's right. what he claims. Um, so <laughs> again, yeah. and uh, you can ask, you know more about this than I do, but there are a lot of things uh, on the table that permeate the political process that have real consequences at state level and that different, differentiate states you know, from, from one another. So another thing that I would like to mention. And then finally, um, for those of you uh, who've taken administrative law with Professor um, Sarnov or are interested in these um, issues, a lot of um, ACA implementation at one point was done through executive order, as you mentioned um, in, in the book. Um, President Obama did it. We've heard more uh, about executive orders uh, recently with President um, Trump, but President Obama resorted to this um, quite, quite a bit. And the thing is, they are sort of an empty uh, means of political um, action, and yet they play the major role with the previous administration as they are playing now with the current administration. So they don't bind uh, future presidents, they don't bind the current president who wishes. Um, those orders. So there are a lot of quirks to the implementation of the ACA that touch upon things that a lot of you are studying um, now, and it's, I think, good to keep that in the back uh, of our mind. This is a very complex um, story. This is a very valuable insight into it. As you well know, there are competing and even contrasting um, narratives of how the ACA came to be and what it might 
um, become so as you read about this, as you think about healthcare reform in months and years to come, because the story is not finished. I'm sure there will be a third book. Undone. Uh, exactly, <laughs> right? Um, so as you accompany this, you know, um, as future lawyers, as policymakers, as law students, as people who need health care, just keep all these things um, um, in mind. And again, I do really recommend um, this book. And I'm going to do the really unfair thing that I get to do because I'm the commentator, which is I'm going to ask the first question. And it's going to be slightly unfair also in the sense that I'm going to ask you not only to do a little bit of futurology, but also think backwards in the negative. So you've told us that, you know, it, ACI has been under attack, it's been divested of its core, but it has survived. You've called it um, pretty resilient, I think. So looking forward, um, what's left of the ACI, you know, as uh, it is uh, right now? So what what's left? What's the contribution, you know, of Obamacare to the healthcare mm -hmm. system in general? Because you've told us today several times that it is, the sky has not fallen. It doesn't really matter, uh, you know, that the mandate has not been um, upheld. So what's its impact Thank right you. now from, from your perspective? And if you can, uh, you don't have to, but if you can, if none of this had happened, do you have any thoughts on what, you know, the healthcare debate would look like now? Um, in America, thank you again. Thank you. That was an excellent PR pitch for my book. So please, thank you so much. Um, and also, you're, you're very fortunate. She really has a good grasp of health law, so you should take her class if you can. Oh, oh this semester you're teaching already? OK, well, you should be in her class if you're not already. Um, I'd be happy to answer the question. Um, the social contract that was mentioned before is very, very important. Um, I think Obamacare's most important contribution is changing the contract in one respect, that people who are sick should not be charged more for health insurance. That is something that I think today polls extremely well, this idea of pre-existing conditions, right? I don't think that was the case in 2008. And now it's almost like a third rail, that even all the candidates trying to repeal Obamacare said, but we'll keep pre-existing conditions. Now, coming back to our trilemma, which was alluded to before, when you keep accessible in there, right, that means people have access to it, the other two got to be affected. So that is now, I think, a central element in any healthcare reform, that people who have health conditions could not be charged more for what they have. They can't be denied coverage. So I think that's a baseline. Now, going forward, I do think Obamacare is resilient because <coughs> the way it was designed, subsidies are paid out based on what people have to actually pay. So if the cost of insurance goes up, more subsidies are added. So people generally, if they're in that bracket, where they're eligible, don't see the, the cost increase. What I think the future of Obamacare becomes is basically a welfare program, right? That if you're sick, if you're poor, you have disability, et cetera, you're gonna get these subsidies and insurance will be very cheap for you. For people who don't have these conditions, because there's no more mandate, they can buy outside the Obamacare marketplace. They can go to an insurance broker and buy a cheap, thrifty policy. This are a policy that existed prior to Obamacare. So there's a two-tier approach, right? Um, I think this is basically like Medicaid light, right? So if you qualify for Medicaid, you're at the you know, poverty line, wherever it happens to be in your state, you get Medicaid. If you're above that line and you're sick and you're poor, you get these massive subsidies. And for most other people, they keep the insurance they have, or if they're on the individual market, they go buy their own cheap, thrifty policy. Um, perversely, this would have been my way to balance the trilemma all along. Don't try and make people suffer with their insurance to pay for other people. Just tax them, right? If I, your other part of your question, if I could just said, we'll tax you, have a payroll tax to expand Medicaid and give these sick people subsidies, I will probably back that. But I think the, the, the failing of Obamacare is everyone must be in this marketplace, right? And a lot of people had worse coverage. They had higher deductibles, smaller networks, et cetera. So I think ultimately what happens is you have a two-tier approach. You're, you're on Medicaid or Medicare, Medicaid light, or you're on the private marketplace, right? But once you remove the mandate, it allows that bifurcation. It allows people to be on two different tracks. And I don't know, maybe, maybe you can give your opinion, but I think that's, that's, that's the general target where we're headed. I don't know, what you, what you think? Probably, yeah. Wow, okay, I'm not wrong, good. We do agree on debts. So. Okay, see, we, we, there's always room for agreement. Uh, but the cost of this is, is, is unfortunate, because now 
whenever we talk about health insurance, we have to talk about politics, which I don't, I'm not a, I don't like partisan politics, I like policy. And uh, unfortunately, this trilemma, this, this, these triangles, right, is now corrupted by the political politicization of this. And that makes people who actually know about healthcare policy in a much tougher spot. Okay? Now, you okay, that's the second question, or are you gonna go to the, uh, go to the, go to the crowd? All right, so questions from the, uh, from the, from the students. Yes? Um, just to this kind of thing about, um, I think Medicaid must have Medicare in addition to that, um, that there are people who, you know, are able to get healthcare coverage or health insurance, to my understanding, I don't know a ton of different research about it, um, but they're able to get that coverage, but I feel like there's still a group of people yeah. who are covered by what Obamacare was like universal, that they're more covered that way, and I feel like if you just go to Medicare or Medicaid, it like, can leave out a small percentage of people who might not get that health care. I was just wondering what you think, if that makes sense. Um, well, let me try to answer your question. Um, the way the Affordable Care Act works is if you qualify for Medicaid, <coughs> you get government insurance. But because the Supreme Court's decision, Medicaid is somewhat off kilter. The ACA told states, all 50 states must cover people at 130% of the poverty line, okay? The Supreme Court said that's unconstitutionally coercive. So as it stands now, about 30 something states have agreed to that level, but for example, Texas where I live has not. So if you're in this gap between 100% of the poverty line and 130% of the poverty line, in Texas you don't get Medicaid. And you also don't get Obamacare subsidies. So you're in this weird gap where you get nothing to help you out. It's this bizarre thing because of the John Roberts opinion. But there are some people who simply don't qualify for subsidies, right? They make enough money, they're well off enough, they don't get subsidies from Obamacare. And for them, they were stuck. They were stuck buying in the marketplace. But now, because of the mandate repeal, they can go outside the marketplace. They can buy a private policy. It might not be good. It might be cheap, right, affordable. But it won't be very comprehensive. You know, there are triangles, right? Uh, but there is going to be a category of people who probably don't get subsidies and who are worse off. So the, the, this is not a panacea, right? This two-track thing I mentioned, it's not perfect. People will bleed between two of them. Perhaps bleed's a bad choice of words, but they will, they'll spill between the two categories. But thank you for the question. Uh, yes, in the back. Um, do you think that the constant um, attacks on the Affordable Care Act by the Republican Party have inadvertently made the act more popular. Yes. Like, I know this year they had like the highest enrollment ever during open enrollment, even though they cut it in half. So do you think that's something that we're going to see more of? Yeah, ironically, I think your, your question is very astute. Uh, the ACA never broke 50% popularity at any point during the Obama years. It's now north of 50% and had one of the most successful enrollments yet. Um, I think people are afraid of losing it. And that's why people signed up in droves to get it. So. Oddly enough, when you attack something enough that people start becoming accustomed to, it increases popularity. But even there, it's a 50, I mean, you know, maybe 55, 45. It's never achieved the sort of universal popularity that its, that its drafters had proposed, which is why this two-track system, I think, may actually support it. Like, say, so, yeah, fine, let poor and sequel be on their thing, just don't mess with my health insurance, right? Let me keep what I have and don't, and just let everyone else get, you know, the government insurance with subsidies. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, in the back. What do you think is going to happen to the subsidies? Well, the subsidies are paid out through permanent appropriation, and I don't think those are getting touched. In fact, to the extent that any health care bills pass this year in Congress, it's to beef up those subsidies. There, there are various proposals to do that. So those are set. Um, it, there, there are ways of, again, I keep calling it resilient, but there are ways of rejiggering how states structure their, their marketplaces that they can basically work around any sorts of repeal efforts. So again, this thing is you know, the undead law, right? It can't be killed. But it, it, it because these subsidies are paying out, right? Now, again, when I say subsidies, this is taxpayer dollars being spent on insurance. Don't, 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 it's not free money. It's not like writing a check out of thin air. It's just taxpayer dollars. But so long as those taxpayer dollars are flowing, people don't see it on their tax returns. So, oh, paying taxes or whatever. But it does, it does increase the deficit. In fact, one of the reasons why this tax bill is significant is it cut out the funding of the mandate, and that increases the deficit as well. Uh, yes, ma'am. And one of the things we're struggling with this in this country is this mix of private insurance companies and subsidies from the government and individual, you know, there's mm -hmm. this private public mix that we're struggling with. Um, in Europe and in other parts of the world, 
they don't have these struggles. Is there any model out there, Europe or otherwise, that uh, that's is a question. better suited to what it's we're our, trying to It's our question for our worldly, knowledgeable healthcare scholar. I'm a, I'm a mere calm law person. I don't know. Do you have any suggestions to answer a question? This is beyond my pay grade. Uh, I think it goes down to the political and you know, philosophical you know, underpinning of our system. I mean, it, we could have Senator Sanders come in and he would <laughs> tell you how things should work. Um, here, and I, I assume a fair number of people in this building would love that idea, you know, people who are not uncomfortable with, uh, you know, governments being in charge of, you know, certain um, things. The problem is, politically, it's just undoable. So I, I think that Professor Blackman is uh, correct in that we'll always have this, you know, dual approach to healthcare, you know, financing in, in America. I, I, I don't see a way anytime soon for us to, you know, get out of it. And a small follow-up to that is um, traditionally in this country, we have been an employer-provided yeah. insurance. Mm -hmm. That's been a model. I know in 2005, I became self-employed and was self-employed for 10 years. So I struggled with this idea of like, oh, your employer is going to pay for it. So it's no, nothing out of your pocket. And um, do you see that changing? Yeah, so this this is actually probably we're gonna this. one of the biggest drivers of health care costs is the employer-provided model. It's a very bad idea to have your insurance peg to your employer, because if you want to leave your job, you might not. Um, this is actually a vestige of our tax system, right? Um, when an employer gives you a paycheck, right, you pay taxes on the income they pay you. But when they give you a very generous health insurance package, you don't pay tax on that. So following World War II, labor unions generate these really generous healthcare packages. Even their salaries weren't as good, they had these really good gold-plated Cadillac healthcare plans, which were not taxed. That is not going to be touched anywhere. In fact, one aspect of the ACA, the Cadillac tax, which is called the Cadillac plan, right, was meant to tax these very generous policies. That will never go into effect. It's been delayed, it's been delayed, it keeps getting delayed. So one of the few things in Obamacare that actually liked that would have pushed us away from this employer model plan has been basically spiked by Democrats, Republicans alike. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, regarding the individual mandate, um, I assume it uh, you had mentioned, I think it was repealed uh, this year, probably January 1st. Uh, yeah, at the end of the year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, as far as like the Affordable Care Act goes, like the education was never very good as far as like what went into it, which I think was part of some of the issues with it. Mm -hmm. um, I, at this point, it seems there was probably a lot of people who don't even know the individual mandate nope. has been repealed. So do you see it in the, say, like the next few months, if, if it actually if it's advertised that the individual mandate has been repealed more than it has been, that you're going to see that at least people our age jumping out of the... I, 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 yeah. I think, so the way it works is when you, if you go, if I'm uninsured right now in February of 2018, it won't really matter until I follow my taxes the following year. But I think at some point the next people will start dropping out of the marketplace, and especially for younger and healthier people, the, you know, the, the invincibles, they call them, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, they may just stop getting insurance knowing that they will be healthy and healthy next year. Some of my students, I can tell you, have already done this. They say, screw it, I'm not getting insurance. They only had, my students were paying the penalty. Now they're going to say, forget it, we won't even do that much. Yes? Um, have you seen, how have you seen, like... This will be the last question, so you guys can just hang tight real quick. Yeah. Um, have you seen, like, the healthcare debate and, like, all the policies that have been changing? Like, has that um, substantially affected, I guess, overall health? Um, I, I'll answer your question a little bit differently. I'll wrap up here. Maybe you'll come up afterwards to ask more questions. Uh, the Obamacare debate, and I've written two books on this, has corrupted healthcare policy in an unfortunate way. Um, you can't just talk about how do we best balance the trilemma, right? There's almost a fourth triangle called politics. And there are going to be half the population that reflexively oppose whatever is proposed, and half will support it emphatically without any question. And that's a very better way of making policy. Uh, I wish this hadn't been done, right? I wish maybe in 2009 Republicans had played ball a little bit. They did it. Maybe in 2009, if Obama hadn't been able to get 60 votes, he might have tried something a little more moderate, of maybe just expanding Medicaid, right? Or expanding Medicare. But they went full in, and this is a situation we find ourselves in. Please come back for questions, but thank you all so much. And I will uh, be able to sit down and ask another question. Thank you.